Hey, I'm Richard Miller with Goldie May, and this is the live genealogy research series. Watch as James Tanner and I, along with invited guests, work through a genealogy problem with no script and no agenda. Maybe you'll learn from the big strategy, maybe you'll learn from the small features and the tools, or maybe you'll just see a better way to do it and you can leave a comment so we can all learn. I hope you find this really helpful. Now here is the research. Welcome to episode 16. I'm here with James Tanner, and today we're gonna to look at a case where one of my ancestors, I think we've looked at him before, just doesn't have much info for his mother. So James, I, I scroll down to Leonard's, Leonard's mother, Sarah Ann, and we really just don't have much for her. And I can show you that. I've got the tab open here. But uh, you know, she appears in an 1850 census as Sarah A. Wilson from Upper Canada. And then there are other records where it says French Canada. So I think we're talking about Quebec. And then I think the obituary for Leonard James mentions his mother being Sarah Ann Wilson. But I never have seen a, a, you know, a maiden name for her um, and, and nor the names of her parents. So pull you in on this and get your thoughts on looking for the identity of this Sarah Ann who's from Quebec. Looks good. A couple of initial impressions here. If you go back to the detail page. Okay, we'll go to her details. Yep. Yeah, her detail page. It looks to me like there hasn't been anything found specific about her. It says a death date isn't even known for certain. Uh, given the dates here, if she died in uh, after 1850, obviously we're going to be looking for that. There's the 1870 census, but we would want to find the 1850 and 1860 censuses to make sure that we had the whole household okay and i think so i do have those eight, okay least, 50 yeah. and 60 are on there mm -hmm. okay and then 70 mm -hmm. okay those are always the basis so let's look at each one of those see where she was if she moved around okay uh, putnam sanaquin yeah. county yeah and, and then uh Adair 60. County, Iowa. Yep. Yeah, in 60. Oh, it looks like there's a movement there. Uh huh. Okay. And, and then, then 70 is still Adair County, Iowa. Okay. Um, so and there should be a uh, death record in, at least from Adair County, it would seem like they would have a death record. In okay. That, in, a, in, a, in that 1870, that 1880. Age. Okay. And the, the death record, the death date, is, you know, this five year range, 70 to 75, I put there because I think I'd found her in a deed record where she and her husband sold land to, I think, the son in law, James Miller, on 1869. And then there's a, another deed record where just Hugh, the father, sells land, possibly all of his land to uh, his son and son-in-law. So she, was not, she wasn't on that second deed. And so the father remarried. And so I figured maybe this is the time frame in between those two events between the 70 census and then the 75 deed record where she dies, the father soon remarries. So um, that's the range that I, that I have for that. So you're, you're thinking maybe we jump into the Adair County records in that range and see if there's a death record? Yeah, well, here's the the, kind of rule that we're following is that she's got an indefinite kind of birth area. Canada is not going to help us a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sarah Ann, and without a surname, isn't going to help us at all. Yeah, really rough, right? <laughs> yeah. And so what we want to do is this is kind of an underlying rule. It's not really a hard and fast rule. It's just a general, yeah, this is probably a good idea to begin with the most recent records. So the most recent records here are going to be death records, uh, probate records, anything that would go along with that where they might mention her maiden name and also a place where she might have been from. But okay. that's not as likely in those records as at least finding her maiden name may be. Uh, okay. Let's look at the census record that's most that's most close to her for a start. So that 70 is what I have. Yeah, let's actually yeah. look at the record over there, okay. the original. People generally in those time periods lived near their relatives. And so once you find them in the census, you'd like to look around on the other people who are living in the area to see if there's any names that, that come up that might be helpful. I don't know if this throws us off a little bit, but you know, she's uniquely, I think, from Canada, but you're saying maybe we need to be looking for other people from Canada in around them. 
that might be a good idea in case okay. they came down with other immigrants. So let me just, maybe I'll stop at the, start at this top of the page here and we just look, I see. Uh... Yeah. So if we, this, this will only go so far. Sometimes yeah. if you just look at the entry, for example, it will have show a mother-in-law living with them. Mm -hmm. And then of course you'll get a surname out of that, of a mother-in-law. Okay, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think I have anybody from Canada on this page and no mother-in-law. Well, since his, her husband, where was he from? He was from New York. It was his birthplace. If I remember. Yeah. New York, because if they moved, it probably would have moved to where his family was rather than where her family was. It was, it's possible. I've seen that, but it's not as common as the husband following brothers and sisters or whatever parents to a different place if they're leaving. If it helps, I think he was Quaker and they moved to Canada to join the Children of the Peace, which was a, you know, an offshoot or a sect of Quaker, mm -hmm. uh, of the Quakers. And I, that may have been where he met her because he, he had gone to Canada and then eventually made his way back. And so oh, okay. it's possible that none of her family came with them uh because of that but that's that's the little i know yeah, that about would be true what took him to Canada. um there may also be quaker records quakers do keep records and we family search has quite a few quaker records they're not consistent but they're if you if you happen to find a quaker record it'd be and it's helpful to have them when they were read into the to whatever their organization there. that yeah. they were involved in okay. and read out and that might be a key to help finding exactly where they were. And and the other thing would be that if we if you traced him back to that group, whatever it was, it would be very likely that she was from there at that area. So that would be a good place to start. Okay. And then one her. maybe other wrinkle is that, you know, the records say French Canada, Upper Canada, but the Quaker group was living in Ontario, which I think okay, is so here's, lower Canada. If you go to the research wiki. Okay. For Canada. Down, and you will, right? what you're going to find in the research wiki, and we don't need to go through a, a long examination of this. We just mention it. But in the research wiki, it'll tell you how that all works. So if you click over on Canada there in North America and um, and get a little okay. bit of history. No, okay, yeah, no, to to, yeah, don't start with Ontario. Start with I just Canada. go to the country. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then if you go down on the map down below, See, what happened here is Canada's provinces and territories that we see now have changed. And the, the eastern part of Canada was two parts, upper and lower Canada. <laughs> so there wasn't really any kind of designation of where they were until the various provinces were created. So one of the things you want to know, let's start with Ontario. So just click on, on Ontario. It says... The first European settlements were in 1782 to 1784, when 5,000 American loyalists entered what is now Ontario following the mm -hmm. revolution. So if you look at his, his dates, he's later than that. So they were already established. But it, here's where it starts to says, the Constitutional Act of 1791 split Quebec into the Canada's upper Canada, southwest of the Lawrence, St. Lawrence and Ottawa rivers and lower Canada east of that. So British North American Act took effect in, in 1867 that established Dominion of Canada with four provinces, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Quebec, and Ontario. You'd need to be really aware of this because it, de it determines where these records may or may not be located. Hmm. Okay. Now there's one other thing to know about Canadian. There's lots of Canadian records on Family Search. There's a lot, a lot more Canadian records on Ancestry, and there's a significantly large number of Canadian records on Find My Past. So there are three okay. different websites that we would want to be involved in, and then there's a fourth. If you scroll down a little bit further on this, on this uh, research thing, you'll see the archives and libraries in the last little block on the right, down low. Mm, yeah. And if you click on that, the National Archive of um, uh, of Canada. 
Library and Archives of Canada. It's mm-hmm. the first link up there. This is a really good resource for records because it, they have free access to a lot of their records online. So this is a place okay. you can go to search for records for Can- for Canadian records. Then you can also look at the individual province archives. And then oh, yeah, sometimes, back, yeah. yeah, and sometimes in, in Canada, they have county archives in addition to that. So okay. there's a lot of levels of records to initially search. It's not like, well, we don't know where to go. But that doesn't help us if we can't locate who she was from Sarah Ann to a name and a date. So to do that, we're going to have to consider her to be an immigrant, which she was, and start in the country of her arrival, so in the United States, for records about her. Okay. So now we know, but now we know there's all these different records you need to look at if once you get to Canada. But before that, you've got to find out where she came from. <laughs> yeah, and, and so you're saying even, it, it may be true that her parents were American loyalists that came to Canada before she was born. And so if you go back far enough, maybe we are back in the the United States or pre-United States looking there as well. Yeah, so it, okay. it's very possible. But we'll start with uh, the latest first, right? The the, mo- the most recent right. first. And, and, and if, uh, we, if we can find a death record, so let's go to the catalog and okay. we're looking in where she probably died would be in Putnam. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Adair, 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 Adair. Adair. Yeah, Adair County. Okay. okay. Yeah. So here's Adair. There are cemetery records, which might be helpful. Here's inscriptions from cemeteries of Adair County, earliest dates through 70, 90, through 76, grave markers, quite a long list up there of things. And then yeah, down and then the vital, vital records, records death, death records. See, they're not going to start until way, quite late. Okay. Yeah, a little bit late for us. We said 1875. So, yeah. I think we just missed her in a death record, maybe. Yeah. Okay. But, so, let's look at a, the cemetery records would be the secondary place to go to. And let, and the easiest way to do is find a grave and and billion graves. Okay. Also go ahead and that, check this. From that standpoint. So, we're going to just look Maybe for Sarah, Well, yeah. We have Sarah Ann, but we have no worship. And the Sarah Zadir County, Iowa. No great photo, but that's that. You know, Sarah Ann Wilson. That's probably her with her married name. But Sarah Ann Wilson of infirmity and old age. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think this is her, and I've not read this before. So Sarah Ann Wilson of infirmity, old age. Son at her sons on Grand River, seventieth year of her age. She was the wife of Hugh Wilson and was among the first settlers of Adair County. Christian neighbor, higher, highly esteemed. Doesn't say much. Greenfield, the 15th of 1874. So that was, oh, she died the 12th of December. There's your death. That'd be the right range. Yeah, that's the right range. So um, that's cool to see that. I haven't seen that before. Yeah, so you'll save that off, obviously. uh, Make sure it's on your research log over there. Yeah, let me put that in here. And then we'll, uh, I'm going to make a note to. um... Okay, so that helps. Now we have a death date. Okay. All right, so. I mean, I guess if we're just brainstorming here while we're talking, I'll just, um, whoops. I, well, it's a good, it's always have, helpful. Let me put this to, in right now while we, yeah, while we're uh, talking here too. Yeah, because it's the, helpful to, to keep, here's the way I do it usually is any information that I find while I'm doing research, uh, looking for information, I always make sure I copy it into the family tree and into any other thing that I'm working on. It's always a good idea, and I know you do that through Goldie May just directly, but I'd keep a, a chronology, a timeline. Well, I do, I yeah. Get, I mean, I, I, I prefer it. to have it all in fun in family search and, and kind of just only temporarily in Goldie May. Mm-hmm. So that, that clears that up. Yeah, that's nice. I mean, and now we could have family searches hinting engines looking for other records Something. potentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, go back to the find a grave and let's get all the information that we have from that. If there's anything else. Yeah, maybe that was it. Cause it's just, uh, it says burial. Well, that true? Yeah. Let's see. I think we're looking. Now automatically, this isn't something that we can do anything about right this minute, but automatically when you have a um, death date and a burial place, it's a good idea to see if the cemetery records or burial records have any additional information. So 
let's let's just kind of track this is this is late enough her death is late enough in 74 that a lot of this is going to be the, the same across the united states so she dies and then let's talk about kind of the normal case then she would be they would contact a mortuary or funeral home for their assistance and that they would have funeral home or mortuary records and then they would have to buy uh, or have a cemetery plot. So we'd look at where that cemetery, if it's actually an organized cemetery, this appears to be because it's called the Greenfield Cemetery. And uh, so we could find that that Greenfield Cemetery and be able to, there, um, there it is. It's the Adair County Cemetery. So there's going to be cemetery records. And the cemetery records back in that time uh, involved purchase of the of the cemetery plot, and also there's usually a permit to um, transport the body sometimes, and there's another permit that's possible. It's called to open the grave. Hmm. There may be a another permit to close the grave, and you may think, well, yeah, but where would all these records be? Probably piled up in the county records in that Adair County. Not necessarily scanned or digitized yet. No, they they may yeah. or may not exist, but if you find them, they may have a, everything you can ever think about about these people. Okay, cool. By the time you get through that process, and then if they get a marker on the grave, then there's going to be more documents uh, that are talking about the grave marker. And so, a decent chance that those would contain a maiden name or parents' names potentially. Um, that's very possible. Okay. Yes, some of those things, my I have kind of extensive research in that regard because I was doing a, a test project, a beta. I was beta testing the Family Searches uh, program that they use to do the digitizing all around the world. Okay, and me doing it. It wasn't a group. It wasn't just an open beta test. It was me oh, cool. sitting in the sitting in the Mesa Cemetery digitizing records for two years. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> Okay, so basically, I looked experience. at every kind of record that there was in the world, and finally figured out that all these other records exist. They are yeah. out there. They may be in a library, like they were. In, they were in the Mesa Public Library, part of them. Cool. Once you're aware that this kind of record may exist or could exist, then you can spend your time looking for the records, which is very profitable. And, and incidentally, you may find other things. One time when we went to, this was here in Utah, we went to Nephi and we were looking for the grave. We we're looking at a cemetery and they sent us to the, to the, the city offices to ask about the cemetery. Hmm. And we found the, the cemetery records in the city offices, but they said, oh, by the way, we have another book here that has a list of all the people who, were, who came to Nephi, Utah and when they were born and when they died. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I went, okay. And where else are these records? No, they're right here in the office. There's one other copy of it, and it's at the Family History Library in Salt Lake. Oh, wow. So for guess what kinds of records might turn up in the process of what you're doing. So Let no me, substitute for a, a, an in-person visit if you can. Right. Knowing that there are the extra records out here, then we can move on because we're not going to resolve all the problems of the, doing the research today. During okay. That. Yeah, so we'll focus on what's online here. today. But, but if then, you're yeah. now aware of those records that could exist, then we can move to what other records that we would want to see. If he died, if she died first, and then hmm, and then he got married later again, it may not be very likely that they would that she would show up in the probate records, unless he happened to comment in the probate records in his will or whatever that they were the children of my first wife whatever oh okay yeah but it would be worth finding that because um, anything you add to it uh, on the part of the husband has the tendency to come up with the wife's maiden name okay but we won't spend the time to do his research right now okay but that is uh, one place where you would look moving back in time. Probably another good place is to go to newspapers. And uh, why don't we just do a real quick search in the Library of Congress 
chronicling America. And this is um, for all the states. We're going to Iowa and we're going to get a date for her death. We're looking for an obituary. Okay, now you want to do an advanced search. There's a tab up there for an advanced mm -hmm. search. And you want to, with this phrase, you want to put Sarah Ann in the phrase, the last field down there. We'll, we'll select a bunch of stuff too. Okay, now you go to states, go up to states and go to Iowa. And you just want all the yeah, newspapers, the you don't care the, just, where they were. Um, she picked some years here, so. Yeah right there like a year before and a year after or something sure. now the the red marks are where they're mentioned the names are mentioned and we probably won't be able to go through all this today either but it at least it gives you an idea of what that's yeah if you zoom out you'll see if that's any other things in red I think there's nothing else there okay, okay. yeah and then i think and, i'm not paginating by matches there there we go I mean, really, the years, it was the December of 74, so these are not close, date-wise. No. Okay, so... Okay, it, so, okay, that's worth that, a shot. That's always, now, this yeah. may not be all the newspapers, because the Chronicling America, Historic American Newspapers from the Library of Congress is not exhaustive. And there are some other newspapers.com, for example, and there's other newspaper websites that's... Uh, that are, would be helpful. And what we're looking for, we're still back on death. So we're looking for an obituary. And, and, and James, it's true that they are not exhaustive on the digital side, but as far as being a directory of newspapers, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're more they're complete, exhaustive, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're more complete. Yeah. Then I wonder if I go look at, yeah. If I look well, at she was county. buried in the Greenfield cemetery. Yeah, we could check like that. Let's see, uh, so this is kind of saying what papers were running at the time she mm -hmm. was it died, right? Let's see if I mm -hmm. go like that. That's not helping. Mm, so, okay, yeah. so nothing in that county, maybe, but maybe other, or that city, but maybe other counties. Uh, yeah, sorry. just the county. Just other put the county. county. Yeah. Yeah. There's the mm. there's the newspapers and when they were. Okay, so I could open those up and then you could check out holdings on those ones. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. So that's not going to be resolved either. That's another yeah, sort of open, future kind of research case, thing. Yeah. But that's something that we should you should be aware of because you're still on the on the death record. And mm -hmm. so you want to have that. The other thing would be uh, a church record from a church that they belong to that might have, have noticed and had a so let's see. We had a record. we had a catalog we had a catalog page open. I think we could go back to that. Yeah, you can get rid of some of those up there, like from the LLC in there. Yeah, church I records. We, so I know. Yeah, I think we, we looked. I think we looked for death records, but we didn't look at the church records. Okay. If there are any, and I don't think there are any. Let's see within there. There's a church. Here they are. Yeah. Presbyterians, seventy-eight. Mes Methodist. Right? Did we just? Yeah, we I mean we're a little. They're not. There. If you said they were Quakers, yeah. then. Yeah, as far that was where they lived in Canada was in that Quaker community. So and, okay, those church records are a little late, but that's that was worth a shot. So let's let's look up something else. Let's let's go to Google and look up Quakers in Iowa. So there's a Qua there's a whole book there, Quakers of Iowa. As you go down, it says uh, Iowa Quaker Orthodoxy and minor body minority bodies of friends in Iowa. Yeah, so that's a uh, this is an interesting book. I wonder yeah, if this so you is searchable even if, if said, even if you, they don't happen to mention the name of either of your people, it is very helpful to read that kind of history and, and gain the information you need to know to make further to do further research. Yeah. I mean, if that's what brought them to Iowa instead of Kansas or something, that'd be really helpful to know. Well, in that time period, Iowa was just the next place out hmm. for getting land in homestead okay. lands. Okay. So here's another a avenue is the land. You saw there were some deeds and mm -hmm. um, copies of the deeds because at that time, 
that the wife would have had to have either signed a disclaimer, as you've noted, that she doesn't appear on the deed, later deed, because she may have died or she did die. Now we all know when she died. But the deed would have, she would have to do what's called a disclaimer deed or a dis, or it sometimes is written right into the deed. And then she signs the deed. And that says that she waives or disclaims any right to her dower interest. Okay. So that so what been... happens, what happens when, a, when a, there was a marriage, which is called coverture in the legal term. And under coverture, the wife preserved some rights by bringing what she brings to the marriage. And so what happens is, and it's usually one third of the property. And what happens in, uh, in land transactions is that if they don't, if they fail to waive the, the wife's dower interest, her dower interest is preserved. She can come back years later after the husband's died. We're talking about if the husband died first, obviously, but she could come back much later and uh, assert her dower interest against the property, even if it had been sold to a third party or other third parties, because it'll remain a, a, a cloud on the title. Hmm. So they're they're motivated to have her sign that document and if absolutely, she that, yeah, yeah, they know that okay. a purchaser is a purchaser is not going to buy a piece of property unless they're you know don't know anything. Okay, uh, I'm not going to say stupid, but you know. But if, if they didn't get the wife to sign off, and sometimes she has to sign off with her maiden name. Another thing you want to look at on the deeds is whether or not think, a um, who signed as witnesses. Get that. They, okay. may be, they may be her brothers. It's a good that. Especially so if I'm... she's signing a disclaimer deed. Now, see, he, she's signing this by Wilson Clerk, it says. Oh, Mark. Oh, she by just Mark. signed by her Mark. That's right. Okay. 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 Yeah. So she couldn't read or write. Okay. Uh, let's see. If you go down to the bottom of the, of the deed, the word, the language, no, just instill in right the now. deed. From the war and defense, for instance, claims Sarah Ann Wilson uh, duly relinquishes mm -hmm. all her right and dower in and for the property. Okay, so there's her dower right waived. Now, if you go down and see who's signed as witnesses. Now, this is already, is that? Uh, uh, well, you can't let's see. They're just okay. official. It looks like they're official people. Okay. Yeah, that that was a sealed not document. A separate. So. Uh, okay, and that's a separate one. Okay. Well, see, okay. it answers another question. At least she's mentioned there as having her dower interest and also signing with her ex on that on that um, particular property. Okay. Well, now if, they, now if that property was being sold to someone besides a Wilson. Uh, we would want to know if that was her brother or one of her family. Okay, members. yeah, and I think it's James Miller, uh, son-in-law, if I remember correctly. So oh, I think, so, uh, so I think so that identifies Mullen, him as not yeah. not being her her relative. Yep. So you see, if we're working through this, we're working through a, a structure of how their lives were going to interact with records. And once we yeah. know when they are going to interact with the records, then we're following those pathways to determine uh, her maiden name, because we're looking for any record that may have required her to supply a maiden name. And sometimes it's just a surprise out of the blue that it's mentioned, like in a will or in a deed or in a school record or something, anything. It doesn't really, it, it's no logic to it. But um, the only way you're going to, to answer both the questions, which are her, her surname and the place where she came from, is to follow this kind of systematic looking at all the records that you can find about the family. So the more records you have about them and their children, the more likely someone would have written in a Bible record from anything from Bible record to a, a land or property record could have mentioned what their mother's maiden name was or their wife's maiden name was. That's great. Well, I love the reminder to be looking for potential 
brothers of hers that uh, could have signed on transactions. Yeah. yeah, that's a great reminder. That happens quite frequently. And then at least you have another surname to start looking for, which gives yeah. you a, it gives you a way to get into it. There's some other things. So we've we've gone through the death records. We're, we're, we've looked a little bit at the, the land and property records. We're looking, we need to, and newspapers we've mentioned, which would be another way to look because we there may be an obituary saying mm-hmm. where she came from or who her family was, a family member that came to the funeral or whatever. And so that's another set of records, or funeral records that may be still in existence at a mortuary. Or that's interesting. Yeah. A funeral home. Yeah. So if you if you go to Greenfield, Iowa, which is apparently where they near live near, just as the Google yeah. search. Okay. No. To, uh, yeah. Greenfield. Well, maps would be fine, but you can go to Greenfield, Iowa, and then put in mortuaries. Here's the thing about mortuaries. They are long lasting funeral mm-hmm. homes and mortuaries because if they, it, it, they keep transmitting all the records because usually they're tied into a cemetery and they need the records that go back in the cemetery. So if you were to copy to contact Lamb Funeral Home or Greenfield Cemetery, it's very possible. There's the Greenfield Cemetery Funeral, funeral Home. And so if you were to call them and see if how far back their records went, I talked to a cemetery in Arizona, for an example, where their cemetery records went back to their records, the mortuary records went back to 1870s. That's which incredible. Was really close yeah. to the time when anything was recorded in Arizona. And, and they also had another mortuary in Nevada and had the same set of records. Wow. Yeah, no, that's cool. I, I'd have to try that and call them and uh, see what they have. Yeah. So if, you know, it could have made, if they could have recorded or made name in, in any one of the records that they created. Cool. Simply well, as a good. way of, that's... of identifying her. Well, I think we've covered it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Do again, do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, good. That'll give me plenty of things to do over the week yeah. and uh, we'll get back again. Yeah. Time passes when you're having fun. That's right. Yeah. Thank you, James. (laughs) Thank you. We'll see you. Talk to you later. Bye.